<clears throat> Hello, friends. Excuse me. I hope you are having a great day. You will see on the Bright Space linked announcement that I'll be um, providing you the link for the review class, the Teams review class for term test number one. The doodle said that Monday night at 6 p.m. AST was going to be the most popular time. So you asked, I will deliver. Uh, I said it was going to be an hour. I decided to have an extra half hour at the end, uh, just in case there are more questions, uh, just in case these, um, a question that I received was, will there be a practice set of questions? Yep, uh, you've, been, you've been doing them. They are our connect practice problems. So we are <clears throat> overlapping our efforts, excuse me. And essentially, we take a peek at the at the how the course is divided and the admin, so the item that I posted last week that I mentioned, but how the course progresses. So how does the pre-work flow into the videos, flow into the CPOA questions, flow into the CPOA debrief questions and these debrief videos. Then every three chapters, how do those flow into the connect practice problems and how do those prepare you for the term test? Similarly, you'll see that each one of those has a parallel to the CPA program, which acts as a bonus, but not a, an absolute requirement. And it's not like you're doing any extra work. You're just not going to have to relearn the same material in a different way for CPA. So friendly reminder, next Thursday is going to be the term test number one. And please read the rules that I posted in your syllabus and email me if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, I will also say that I've been talking to my colleagues and um, we have provided a number of names to her and I heard that only a few people uh, reached out to her and said that they would be interested in a GDIP or a PEP program. Uh, I must say guys, um, start thinking about if you're planning on doing CPA next year or if you're thinking about it, attending some of those sessions. We have our recent grads who attended those graduate diploma, the GDIP, programs. We also have my TA Bryce and a few other students that I reached out to and said that they would be a part of this. So let Laura know uh, we're working together behind the scenes uh, for a coordinated effort because we know that many of you are taking all three of our classes. So there's no point in us all doing the same thing. Okay, so reach out, uh, some U of T, some Carlton, some Queens, um, and PEP. So with Bryce, our TA being there. Okay. So I wanted to show you here that this was our, oh, pardon me, this was our chapter 12, so our first set of pre-work. I designed it to be about an hour and a half, or probably hour and three quarters to about two and a half hours, pretty wide um, breadth, and it ended up coming in at three hours. But now you'll see that um, what I had originally targeted, that it's, we're getting there, and this is the second week. So I assume that as we get used to the pre-work, that this will continue to go down to right around what our target is, although this is pretty close. So the aim of the pre-work is explained by that visual in the content admin, but essentially it's so that you can get immersed and you can get familiar before diving into sort of the, sum, not summary videos, but like the topic videos. So what are the big wins, the intricate wins, what's a way to reinforce and test your knowledge before you go on and apply them in an even, uh, in a vague environment. Not like vague, vague, but you know, in an undirected, I should say, a less directed. You know, clients really throw things at you. Auditors throw things at you. Uh, government officials throw things at you. And being able to identify the issue, apply a framework to solve it, provide a conclusion, and advise them on next steps. Big wins there. Okay, so I want to give you a hint. Uh, <laughs> this is your reward for watching the debrief video or for uh, somebody who watched the debrief video telling you. This Monday night's CPA way graded assignment for chapter 14 will be, I guess I just dropped it. Um, this wrap up one will be a graded one. So it will be graded with the rubric. So even though I know that you'll provide exact as much, <laughs> the same amount of time and effort and care and attention as you've been doing for all of them so far, I just want to double let you know that this one will be graded with the rubric. I will also be committing to um, publishing this debrief video for chapter 14 at no later than 
like midnight, midnight AST on Tuesday. You guys are asking really great questions as we'll get into. And, um, you know, I, I haven't wanted to, to cut any of them out because they are all great. Um, many of them are frequent, but also have their nuances. So I've done my best to bucket them and I'll answer them right now. Okay. So I want to, when doing your CPA way question, I want to warn you about being a biased jumper. All right, so in your CPOA question, what this would be referring to would be going from a social situation to saying right away that this is a bond and therefore it's a liability. So the reason why, a number of you asked, why did we just go through, um, why did we have to go through the liability definition, And even though it's a bond? Well, I wanted you to analyze the characteristics of why it was a bond and what it meant to be a liability because you're going to see things and I'm going to bring it up again and again, substance of reform, where somebody might call something a bond, but then it might have characteristics of bond or like debt and equity, or it might have characteristics of all equity, but then call it a bond. Um, and we're going to see examples of that after term test number one and term test number two. So and to get you consistent with thinking about uh, these items. All right, so I have also um, linked in the description a um, blog post from my colleague at the CPA Western School of Business, Nikki Marshall. She is an award-winning, multi-award winner, uh, winning educator, uh, and she is somebody I've worked with for years, and we have done multiple, multiple training sessions uh, for their educators and for candidates, and she wrote a blog post on how to, tips on how to write a better case response. So now that we have started to get used to seeing CPAOA questions and starting to see different cases, uh, we can start thinking about how to write more efficiently and effectively. So again, a lot of you are hard on yourselves for your debriefing, be kind to yourself. There's a reason they're completion. There's a, uh, there's a reason why I care about your quality of your debrief because it's not what you know when you hit submit, it's what do you know after and where's the growth that you have obtained. Okay. Somebody wanted to know, um, many people wanted to know actually, um, why is there a requirement to record interest? Um, and what? Uh, where did the 96,000 come from? So I'm gonna open up our question here, as well as get an Excel going. Okay, so where did the 96,000 come from? If we take a look at what are face value is, so our 800,000 um, of our bond. So this is a legal contract. They have 12% bonds with a maturity value of 800,000. So if we take 800,000 times by 12%, that is where we get our 96,000. So this is our legal contract. They're 12% bonds with a uh, maturity value. So they're going to um, they're gonna expect us to give them back 800,000 in how many years, in how many years? In five years. Okay, so each year we owe them, we have to pay them the, um, the nominal rate, the 12% rate times by uh, the value of the bond, and we have to pay them $96,000 every year. Okay, and then it said, wait, they're $800,000 bonds, but we sold them for 860000 And so, so many of you were like, aha, this is a premium. And I'm like, absolutely. And then I provided an explanation here about the different wording. Um, people, you are correct. There is going to be wording for um, many different uh, items here. Um, you will see wording such as yield, uh, market rate, nominal rate. So, um, 
and a few people, I couldn't quite tell if you were kind of thinking it through in your CPOA questions, or if you just wanted me to confirm that yes, there are different names for different things, absolutely. Um, and a number of you said, well, I wanna know, how do I make sure that I get it right every single time? Because I, you know, logic out the fact that this is a premium. And I would say, continue to logic it out. If you're looking here at our chapter 13 CPOA question, and if you look at our next CPOA question, um, these clients, um, these users, they don't necessarily know how to ask a succinct questions, so you will have to logic things out. So we saw here that this entire um, bond is providing the bond holders, so the investor, with the 10% yield. Perfect. So now we know that we have um, this would also be, in this case, considered to be the market rate. So I'm not going to repeat exactly what I posted here, but maybe have a peek at the comment and email me any follow-up questions if this still uh, doesn't make sense. Okay, back to our FAQs. Um, why is there a requirement to record the interest expense? There is a requirement to record the interest expense because if we think about this, um, like... By the way, I received some feedback that people liked these quick and dirty calculations, so I will keep doing them. So thank you for the feedback and keep telling me what you'd like more of and feel free to tell me what you'd like a little less of. That is cool too. Beginning, middle, and end. So at the beginning, we know that we have a premium. So we are going to have to record the fact that we as a company are getting cash and we're getting cash for 860,000. $652, uh, $652. Um, and then we are setting up a bond payable for our um, $860 for the same amount. Um, but then people are like, wait a minute, at the end of the story, we are going to have to remove this bond payable and then we are going to have to pay back cash of 800,000. 800, perfect. Let's get some separators in there. Okay, great. So then the question is, wait a minute, how do we get from, how do we get from a credit of 862 to a, uh, to 800? And so the reason, the way that we're going to have to do this is we're going to have to um, make the liability smaller in the middle. So the middle represents uh, the fact like all the years in between, so 2021, 2022, and so forth. So we're going to have to debit this bond payable. Okay. And all of these middles are going to have to add up to the difference. Okay. Tried to make it negative. All right. Oh, and you might be like, is your car on? Yes, I am in my car. I'm outside of yoga. People, today um, I was up late last night reading your awesome questions, and I wanted to get this video out to you ASAP. So I decided to grab a coffee, um, sit outside of yoga because um, I was running some errands, um, and then record this video, get home edit it a little bit, um, and then write up your news post, uh, and then it uh, goes through a little bit of a process in order to render, then I can upload, which also takes a bit of a process, so um, in order to get this up by midnight tonight, I needed to do this now, sitting in my car, it was getting a little bit hot, so here we are, okay. Mm. Okay, so we need to make sure that we are amortizing this bond premium, and then we also need to make sure that we are reflecting the fact that um, there is there is time that is passing. There is time that is passing between 2020 and 2025. And in addition to amortizing this bond premium, we also have interest. So we have our interest expense because we need to reflect the fact um, that there is within here the economic reality that dollars received today are not the same as dollars that will be paid back in five years. So the interest expense really reflects the economic reality that it costs us money. It costs us money as a company to finance and to receive this. Nothing is for free and certainly um, neither are these bonds. Okay, 
And then we need to each each year, each um yeah, each year, we need to pay out our cash, um, our interest payable. I called it cash slash interest payable because it this is just timing. So we still have to accrue it. Somebody said, could it be called accrued interest payable? Absolutely, um, because it's something that we're accruing. Perfect. All righty. So I am in here. And in order to figure out what my interest expense is, I'm going to take the current carrying value, which is what is on my books for my bond liability, and times it by my by my market rate. And then I get this um, item of our 86065. I know that my cash is what we calculated on the last slide, so that's our 96,000. And you're like, Samantha, that doesn't add up. This doesn't equal that. No, you are absolutely correct. And that is because it is a debit, first of all. This is, needs to be a debit, so we're just gonna move that over here. So this is 10% times by here. So now you're gonna say, Samantha, this doesn't, what is that? One, four, six, seven, ten doesn't equal here. No, and that's because this is all of the amortization of the bond premiums for the five years. So remember, this becomes our plug for this year. And we would say, this year it's gonna be 9,935. So what is our current carrying value at the end of this? It'll be year one of the middle. And the current carrying value would be this 86, 860 minus the amount that we amortized this year, so 850. So one exercise that I would recommend that you do at least once is set yourself up a chart. Set yourself up a chart of year one, so maybe that's 2020, 2021, 2022, and so forth um, until the bond is paid back, 2025, and have the um, opening bond liability where we're going to go here amortization okay uh interest expense so just like what we did and i'm not going to do this right now in the video otherwise it'll be way too long but just like what we did with the the table uh for arrow and so you can see that why the beginning ends up being at the end. And yes, we would expect this to be the 800,000 for the closing carrying value of the bond because then we'll go from the 860 all the way to the 800,000 um, by still booking our annual interest expense to reflect the, uh, the transition, the uh, value, uh, the fact that today dollars cost different than future dollars and as well as amortizing that bond premium. All right, the last thing I want to answer um, specific to this is, before we get into the covenants, because the covenants uh, brought their own FAQ question, is some people said, hey, Samantha, um, why is it on here that you recorded this as bonds payable? Um, why didn't you also um, record it as, you know, perhaps a um, 800,000, so you could have done this as, if I'm talking about a credit, um, bond payable for... 800,000 and a um, bond premium of 60,652. I absolutely could have. And then we just amortize this bond premium. And if this would have been at a discount, um, then it would have been a debit to the bond discount. And that would have been something that when the debit and the credit meet, this would have been made get total less than 800,000, which would make sense because that's a discount. And these two together are the premium. It really doesn't matter. Uh, and you'll see in your textbook actually, so take a peek. And um, so when they are recorded separately, that says that they are recorded gross. And in my example, when I recorded them together, they're recorded net. So it really uh, is just personal preference. Um, it's important for me that you saw it, I believe in your pre-work as gross, and now you get to see it here as net. Okay, so that might um, bring you to a question. So could you have gotten this correct? Had you done it gross or net? Absolutely. Um, and 
of course, and I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to say this again during our review class, but if you get something correct on your exam, you have one week. Oh, and it marks it wrong. You have one week to, um, you know, prove your case, you know, respectfully do it. Say, hey, this is what I did. This is um, why it's correct. And the caveat is you have to have followed the instructions. So if the instruction said, put your debits first and then your credits, and you're like, damn, I got the right answer. I just put my credits first. Well, no, you didn't get the right answer because part of the right answer is and is following instructions. So be sure to take a look at your Connect problems because that will mirror uh, the types of questions and kind of the instructions for the types of questions that you will receive in your term test. But if, for example, you record it net and the question graded it as gross, then, you know, take a screenshot, write your case, um, you know, explain to me why upon following instructions, you use a, an appropriate, um, allowable form of the accounting application. And there weren't instructions to state that it must be done net or must have been done gross. And you did the opposite. And I will absolutely go and adjust the grades. I realize that this opens me up to a bunch of emails, but if these are emails from students who debriefed their exams and they did the right thing, bring it on. I'm looking forward to that. So I empower you uh, to, to take ownership of your test and feel, uh, feel empowered and let me know. Okay. So I'm going back here. So was it a premium? It was. And the premium was recorded gross or uh, was recorded net. Okay. What does it mean to advise? So how is this different from the inclusion, uh, from the conclusion? So as you would have seen in the CPA Wave videos, it's, it is conclude and advise. I've split it out here to show you that the conclude needs to be consistent with the analysis. And then when you advise, the advising is like, okay, cool. Now that I've concluded, this is where you need to go. This is where this is leading. This is the impact from your analysis, from your conclusion, from what's happening now. And this is how it's impacting future things. Uh, so for example, if you, um, the client's like, I don't know how to record this, what's going on? And you're like, yeah, that's a debt. That's, you know, that's obviously a liability. And you calculate the liability and before your calculation and your conclusion, the users were on side for their covenants. And afterwards, after they adjust for your edit, for your uh, correcting entry, uh, they're offside. Well then advise them, tell them what the impact is because it's bad news. As I talked about in debrief video for chapter 12, you cannot be a little bit offside on your covenant. So that's how it is different. Um, for cases, uh, you can see conclude and advise together, but not here. So advise, I mean, conclude on your analysis and then advise looking forward. Okay. So I want to point out what I expected to see on a debrief submission. So I provided this exemplar and I asked Bryce, our TA, to provide um, an assignment, wrap-up assignment checklist. So this is posted under uh, Brightspace Content Admin. So make sure that for the weekly wrap-up, um, you complete all of these. Okay, and then this maps directly to our rubric. And so here is just where you'll see that there are marks that go pretty much one for one for each of the um, for each of the items on the checklist. Okay, and then then you will see that there is a reflection piece. So I asked Bryce. Um, he recorded a video, so you get to see that it needs to be you know forward facing. I want to see you. I want to you know um, kind of wave at you. So many of you are so lovely saying, you know, hey, I hope you're having a great day. Thank you so, so much. Okay. So on here, just like Bryce has done, so many of you, most of you have thrown on your track changes and, you know, improved, you know, really beefed up your response or deleted a bunch of stuff. A number of you have deleted. Fantastic. Now, okay. Some of you put comments right in Word. And that's absolutely okay versus, um, you know, putting a comment here. I'm not too fussed either way, but sometimes I can't tell. Are you editing your response or are you commenting on a strength or an opportunity uh, for improvement? 
So make sure that it's super duper clear. One way that it's absolutely clear is that if you have comments. So remember, as part of the checklist, you need to, I'll just pop it up on class. Part of the checklist, have I improved my response? So that would be the track changes we just talked about. Have I reflected about the quality? So do I, have I talked about my strengths? Have I talked about my areas of improvement? You know, people might call this weaknesses. I just think of them as opportunities that you're gonna strengthen next time. So making sure that there's actually some reflection on here. So I need to see some reflection. So, um, you know, what was done well, what wasn't done well, um, and showing your insights. So please take a look at Bryce's exemplar, because he talks here about his strengths, sorry, here. And then he talks here about um, his opportunities for improvement. He actually, you know, puts a few more on here just in case. So please take a peek. I've sent a number of you some messages in your Dropbox. If chapter 13 would have been a graded assignment, you know, which one of you would maybe be in a little bit of, you know, not receiving full marks. So if that's something you're looking for, uh, for is receiving full marks in the graded assignment, please take a peek at these exemplars. Okay. So back to our thing here. Alrighty, you guys. Um, I want to just say before I move on, I want to talk about this part here. Please, it is tricky. I said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, these CPAOA questions are tricky um, because cases are tricky and clients are tricky. And the questions, while the content doesn't necessarily get easier, we start getting like, oh, okay, we start seeing the patterns, we start feeling better because we're like, mm hmm, I see what you're trying to do here and you're not going to get me. Okay. So covenants. Are covenants only applicable on a reporting date? Well, yes and no. Uh, covenants are a legal requirement, so it's whatever is said in the contract. Uh, typically, the contract says that um, you know, as at, and they'll say either quarterly or annual financial statements, this is what it needs to adhere to. So in CPA, what we typically see are annual and or quarterly covenants uh, corresponding to reporting dates. What are the benefits of these? These give the people that are lending you money a uh, peace of mind that you're not going to borrow a bunch of money from them and then a bunch of money from a whole bunch of other people and then fly the executives to Hawaii and bankrupt the company and, and, and peace out. So what are some common types? Uh, you may see covenants such as loans tied to a percentage of AR and or a percentage of uh, inventory. You may see loans, uh, probably covenants that um, tied to a current ratio, so current assets over current liabilities. You may see covenants um, as far as an actual total dollar amount of debt, um, either short term and or long term. You may see covenants, what else? Uh, debt to equity I've seen, um, a requirement um, of, I think those are those are pretty much the common, but you can do, these are like legal contracts. You could put a debt, co pardon me, a covenant on, um, on pretty much anything you can think of. So feel free to comment down below or email me uh, different types of covenants that you've seen or, you know, things that you think would be kind of cool to see. Ha! Huh. Will a borrower ever give an exception for a covenant? Absolutely. Uh, so my friend uh, worked for uh, an investment. Uh, it was an investment company that invested um, in other companies. That makes sense. We'll talk more about her company in a little bit in future chapters. But essentially, um, they borrowed a bunch of money from somebody else, from another company. And then they weren't making as much money on their investments, and they ended up having to renegotiate and restructure. So, <clears throat> excuse me, but before they did, before they renegotiated and restructured, they actually got a waiver. So that's the first step. The moment in a case that you see, you know, your client is offside or... You know, maybe you're the industry, you're the, the company, and you have a covenant that's offside. The first thing that you should do is, you know, not say, oh, it's only a little offside. We learned in the last video that's not a thing. This is a legal, um, a legal agreement that needs to be adhered to. So the moment you find out that you're offside, you would contact the 
the bank or the borrower and let them know. And then also let them know your plans to get back on side for the covenant. And then you have to request a waiver. And if you receive a waiver, then you do not have to put it all as current and you would adhere to what is in the waiver. Essentially, the waiver is like another legal agreement that provides some comfort over the current legal agreement. So yes, um, and the person, uh, a few people brought up this great question and they talked about, you know, relating it to current times. So specifically, you know, COVID with businesses shutting down, um, would companies be more or less likely? And the answer is it depends. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you provide a waiver, it essentially means that you, um, you understand the seriousness of this, that maybe a little bit or more money later is better than no money now. Okay. Why don't long-term loans dilute ownership? Okay. So ownership, and as you'll see in chapter 15, so in our shareholders equity, when you have common shares, that is the residual ownership of a company. So you take all the assets, you pay out all the debts, and what is left is spread over those common shares. So when you issue long-term loans, debit cash, credit, debt, that doesn't dilute the common shares part of the equity. And so that means that whatever is left in the business after all is said and done isn't diluted um, by those long-term loans. Okay, so um, I had a couple questions that I followed up with people individually, um, but essentially if you are going through and you are, you know, having a difficult time um, with, say, a specific chapter or specific, pardon me, a specific topic question, um, let me know. So if you posted a question about topic three question or 14-8, uh, I couldn't um, quite catch both of those questions. So I know that there was a question there, um, but I couldn't quite understand if it was still an issue or if it was more of a comment, like I'm not quite sure how I see these tying into the chapters. So please, 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 um, do email me or comment down below and we'll resolve that ASAP. Okay, somebody asked me, Aspie, um, what are the treatments under Aspie? So yes, you can use the effective interest rate that we've talked about um, for all of pretty much uh, these topic videos. You can use the effective interest rate under Aspie or you can use straight line. What is straight line? Well, let us go back to our quick and dirty example here where we have a bond premium of uh, 60, <clears throat> excuse me, 60,652. And if this was straight line amortized over five years, boom, just like your depreciation for um, an asset, like your amortization or depreciation uh, expense. So you would just take it and straight line. And so what that would mean is here, your plugs are reversed. So first you go to your bond payable and take your one fifth. And then your interest expense would be the quote unquote plug. So then this would be the journal entry for the first year, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. And if you take this, our amortization of our bond premium, and you times it by five, you'll see that at the end of the story, this will still be the 800,000. So as under ASPE, Absolutely. You can use either the way that we did under IFRS, the effective interest rate method, or the straight line. <laughs> okay. IFRS. Um, why? <laughs> why the effective interest rate method? People, it is to reflect the economic reality that um, the interest and the amortization of the bond payable, it's different in year one as it is in year two and year three. So the passage and reflecting of time, just like when you present value back um, in your future costs for an ARO or, or anything else, when you take something $100,000 in five years and present value it back to reflect the economic reality of the dollars now. This is, it builds exponentially, so we can't have it be the same every year. So why I for us wants to reflect the economic reality, it may not seem like it makes a big difference if we're talking about, you know, $9,000 this year or $12,000, but when these start becoming, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger numbers, um, it does absolutely um, impact the user's ability to make decisions based on the financial statements. And under IFRS, we have a whole bunch of different users. And um, yeah, we need to uh, make sure that they see that proper economic reflection of the time value of money. All right. I am cognizant of time here. You guys are doing so, so good. When to record premium um, net versus gross. 
whenever you want, essentially, um, as long as it is in line with your current uh, accounting um, standards, as long as it's what's been done before in the past within your financial statements. And on the test, when it says to, and if it doesn't say so and you got it wrong, make sure you take your screenshots and within a week, email me and I'm happy to investigate that. Are there differences for journal entries when recording different types of bonds? Uh, so in general, no. Um, but of course, journal entries are so uh, company specific, every company, the very first thing you should do, if you are somebody that gets a job in a company and you are booking um, journal entries, ask for the chart of accounts to get familiar with it because all of these things will be named very different in very different, in every company. Borrowing costs. I received a few questions about borrowing costs specific to bond capitalization. Um, how do we capitalize bond interest? Well, instead of going debit to the interest expense in the P&L, that would go to debit to the um, to the asset, so to the PP&E or the <clears throat> excuse me PP&E under construction. Um, what about timing? It has to follow. Um, I'm not. I'm going to link it down below, but it needs to follow um, the capitalization requirements that I believe we talked about in either topic um, three or topic four. Okay. Um, I also want to mention that we had some people jumping your head to future chapters, asking questions about complex financial instruments, asking questions about shareholders' equity, asking questions about you know derivatives and hedging. And I just want to say absolutely freaking amazing. Like, thank you. Makes me so exciting. Um, I tended to answer those questions just right there um, because I don't want to overwhelm these videos. I want to make these specific to chapter 13, but I absolutely want those questions. So I answer those questions right in the um, in the kind of Dropbox when I'm replying back to you. Um, so keep looking at that. Your knowledge, um, these financial statements, they absolutely work in and out and you're applying what you see in work into school and school into work and news into work and school and you're putting the constellation together so keep it up look for patterns look for integration and i just want to say thank you it has been um you know i talked about being up late last night um because i can because it is fun and because i want to work really hard for you because i see how real hard you guys are working for yourselves for each other and how kind you are and um and nice you are uh, in those questions. So it is an absolute honor to continue being part of your learning journey, and I hope you have a fantastic evening. <laughs> Bye. Oh my, are you still here? It's almost like you're expecting that Iron Man aftertakes. My favorite part of the video. I will do my best not to disappoint because I would hate to let any Iron Man fan down. So here's the thing, in yoga the other day, they were like, picture a rainbow, picture the end of a rainbow. Now picture the colors of a rainbow. I was doing good. I was picturing these things. I felt like I was killing the first moment of yoga, which I know I talk about this, but I do yoga because it is good to be in an environment where we're not very good. So anyways, I'm picturing this rainbow, this very one here, I'm picturing the end of the rainbow. And then the instructor is like, picture something green. And I try and I try, but I keep coming back to this one image. And it is dang embarrassing because it is not very yoga. I'm picturing... <laughs> Yep, you got it. I'm picturing this guy exactly like this, and I can't get him out of my mind. So here's my fail. Here's my fail for the week. I am not very yoga, but I try, I get up, I enroll my mat, and I do it again and again and again.
So with that, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for hearing me jibber jabber about a little something uh, extra. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Uh, namaste.